Nope, we got it, we got it. Whoa, we're live. Welcome to Virtually Wild Communities. Here we got Jeremy Peaches from Fresh Life Organic Flow. Yes. And we are at the farm. Yeah. We're gonna show you how this works. Yeah, so we're at Brazos River Farm, a farm that was started by one of my mentors and an uncle of mine, Mr. Terry Green. And we farm here, he's a part of our co-op. And I'm just excited to have you guys here today. Yeah, so we on the Brazos River. Just look at the beauty of it. And the beach and the sand. Mm -hmm. I'm just really excited to talk to you guys today. All right. Yes. Let's take a look at this beautiful river here. Yeah. This is your backyard right here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, sometimes, well, really today we set our lines uh, so we be able to catch fish. Uh, Mr. T is also just all, it's into sustainability as well. We try to have like a, a environment or a space to where it's very aesthetic, clean, and also just everything feeds off each other. So like I said, I'm just very excited to, to show you guys everything today and just talk about you, uh, most of the things that we're doing with the co-op, just like at the urban farm. Can you talk to us about the erosion? Yes, yes. So, um, you know, speaking of, of the environment, um, one of the things that we're dealing with um, in the environment is erosion. Um, sometimes we have these huge hurricanes and we have a lot of flooding and um, that go on in Texas. And what happens is the river fills up at height and capacity and it floods our land. And what happens is the water from the flooding actually creates erosion. So if you look at all this property from here all along, it was about five mm -hmm. to 10 uh, feet out uh, pre, I mean, post Harvey. And as the more flooding that we have, we continue to lose land due to erosion. So these are some of the issues we're dealing with environmentally as farmers, as producers and landowners. We have a just huge rate of erosion and uh, we have to figure out ways to try to mitigate erosion. So you're telling us this whole land used to be like 10 feet longer. Literally, like if I was to walk out 10 feet more, I'm not gonna do it. Um, it was it was way deeper in, but as time goes on every year, the more we have flooding um, in the northern part of the United States, so I mean of Texas or um, around the Fort Bend County area, when the lakes get pulled to go out to the Gulf of Mexico, um, that water rises and it starts to uh, break down all the sand and all the different soils that we have and it pushes our property back in so it affects us because if you look up and we have more major hurricanes floods and storms uh, us as producers we're going to continue to lose land and if we continue to lose land you know it, it, it affects us as farmers and just as landowners and um, you know I'm really excited and I really want to work with a group of people to figure out how can we figure out some erosion issues to help some of the farmers in South Texas um, and use a model to just save you know, the world. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Can you tell us about the soils you have here? So uh, the soils we have here is are real very sandy loam type soils. Um, different parcels of our land they have different variations, but primarily it's a very, very sandy soil. I wish I could pick up some real quick to be able to show you. So sandy or sandy loam soil. Alicia's got it. She's going to find us some soil. Means, yeah. Oh, she's going to find us soil. Basically, it means like we're going to have... Uh, Right, so this is some real sandy soil. It has a lot of minerals on it because uh, we ride along the brasses. If you notice, um, it's, it, as I squeeze it or breaks it, it just breaks down real fine. It holds water very well. So um, when we irrigate or when it naturally rains, the water uh, actually stays inside the soil uh, deep. And like I said, it's very uh, nutrient rich. Uh, we don't in use any like pesticides or herbicides um, on our property or, uh, you know, mild or minimal fertilizers, uh, just uh, composting per se. But um, we're very proud of our soils here. Um, we think South Texas has some great soil. Um, and again, we're probably only 30, 45 minutes from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we're about 20 to 30 minutes uh, from Houston. So uh, we have a lot of farmers and producers around here. Uh, even our neighbors next door have a pecan orchard. So uh, to grow some of these crops, we have natural uh, grasses and wild berries and onions that grow. So 
uh, we think this uh, is a cause of the rich nutrient mineral rich soil that we have. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Let's go see what All you're right. growing. Yes, let's go see what we're growing. So, right now, we have about three to four phases of our land. Um, our smallest phase will be uh, our garden. Well, here. So, our garden is uh, manned and maintained by senior citizens uh, from our family and, or that may want to come out. And, I mean, we grow these foods. We have about 20 to 30 different raised beds here. And we're growing some... Um, some seasonal organic vegetables. Uh, you can come by. Shout out to Felice. What's up, Felice? So these are turnips. They're not big yet. Oh my gosh, those greens are beautiful. Right. So these are turnips. They're not big yet. We probably have a few more weeks to go. We're starting to thin some of them out. But yeah, these turnips are going to be very fresh. So we're going to put some in the pot for Thanksgiving. <laughs> so we're going to kale, mustards, turnips, collards, all the different leafy greens that you eat usually uh, in the fall for Thanksgiving as well. Um, uh, as I alluded to, the difference with our uh, garden is the fact that instead of um, doing direct seed like in our field, in our commercial field, <coughs> we make mounds. So we pile the mounds up, we cover them with plastic to kill all the weeds because we have a, a huge weed problem here in um, Texas or everywhere, <laughs> I'd say. And um, once we pull up the uh, black tarp, we add uh, our compost or chicken manure and then we see by hand. The difference between our garden and our fields, our garden, we use um, a cedar from our, with our, attached to our tractor. But here, everything here is planted directly by seed, by hand. So we intricately go piece by piece by piece by piece. Mm, wow. Right, the traditional way. <laughs> and why do you choose to do that, Jeremy? Oh, um, uh, growing the traditional way is always important because that's how, the only way you know for sure like that your seed will kind of germinate. When you use the cedars or the equipment, they're precise, but it's a connection that we have with growing traditionally. We know we grow you know, sustainably, aquaponics, hydroponics, we use all these equipment, we use all these tractors. It's just something about growing the traditional way. And um, we like to stay true to our roots, I would say. And um, again, just stay precise, uh, hand by hand, tilling the rows, planting the seeds, and the senior citizens that, that come out here, or the elders that come out here, they love playing the traditional way. They like learning about the more the futuristic, sustainable ideas and things, but they love planning the traditional way. And um, I love just being a part of it. Yes, ma'am. Let's go see what else you're growing, Jeremy. Yes, yes, yes. We want to go on this side, that side. Uh, let's go on that side. Okay, cool. All right, can we ask if we're getting any more sound now? We have to get closer. Yeah. So this is our tractor. We try not to till as much. This is a feeder. And we use it plows, make the rows, and also seeds directly. One of our older tractors as well. And this is where we kind of store our equipment. Um, See over here is our like a uh, plow that we use. We try that like till as much. Like you know, we have to till just because you know we don't have the complete equipment or all the money to like have a um, plastic mulcher or some of these things. So what we do is we try to use plows just to break the ground up once or twice. We sit and let the, uh, the grass or weeds die down and we come right behind it with our cedar on the tractor to direct the seed. And that's in the field, I take it in the field. But as you see, man, we deal with grass a lot when you try to farm commercially. So we try not to use pesticides, I mean, or, or herbicides. The herbicides kill the grass, but also that residue in effect um, kills the soil um, as well. It kind of degrades it. 
plant sucks up some of those things. And these are some of the issues that we're dealing with in terms of health. Um, not necessarily um, what we're farming, but how we're farming. So tell, tell us a little bit about the soil. What is, what is the mulching due to the soil? What is tilling due to the soil? How does that affect what your what the quality of your soil is? <laughs> so tilling actually breaks up the soil. It kind of knocks down the weeds. It gives you like a fresh start. Mulching actually uh, suppresses the weeds and adds nutrients to your soil. Um, and what, what was the other one? Why would you want to not till too much? You don't want to till too much because when you're tilling, 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 all this sand and area, nutrients, all that um, your, uh, insects and biology is being open to the air, right? So Pete, when you till three, four, five times a year, consistently, 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 you're steady losing your soil, right? You, if you sometimes you may um, increase your erosion rate, and sometimes you're um, losing a lot of that soil ecology and biology that you need so the reason why we minimize our tilling and some of our equipment is so we can keep some of that ecology in the soil because no we're not a thousand acre farm a hundred acre farm we don't have millions of dollars but we do it is ways to grow sustainably um, and using certain methods that way we can get the most efficiency out of our land or our crops all right yeah. cool what else do we got right so here we have more mustard see we thinned them out it's like because they're real close they're real compacted right so we thin them out compost them or we might replant them and sometimes we repot them and sell at our co-op so we can have for more plants for more people on the weekends and so, why the trenches oh so the, the trenches they actually hold water um on the side so actually uh, go above ground the soil may um, the soil may be dry, you say, but the deeper you go in, it's real moist, real real moist soil, so moist that you squeeze it and it turns into a ball. <laughs> right? Cool. You're right. So so these plants are sucking in um, as much moisture, but they're getting that moisture from underground. You say. in a garden or in a commercial plot is intercropping. Um, so I know you see mustard greens on the side, but if you look at them right here real close in the middle, it's beets. There's beets on the inside of it. So intercropping allows you to grow up. It helps because sometimes pests, they might attack one plant and might not attack the other. So we call it like sacrificial planting. Um, using most or maximizing your space is another reason why we intercrop and uh, to, to have variety per se. And we just try to use different methods, you know, not just one method of growing, because sometimes just doing things singular is what actually uh, kills your plants out or plants get used to it. So we intercrop a lot here as well. So where can I learn about intercropping if I don't have a degree like you do, Jeremy? Ah, uh, well, you know, everybody learned everything on YouTube. <laughs> but you can reach out to your extension agents or agriculture consultants. Extension agents are individuals um, in all counties throughout the United States that work for universities, whether uh, 1890s or 1862, and they provide information to uh, communities, farmers, institutions, organizations on how to farm and uh, intercropping. Uh, look it up. Just look it up online, and I, I guarantee you, um, you will find some information from some of these universities or professionals about how could you intercrop it. And the great thing about intercropping is you can intercrop in your garden, you can intercrop in your field, you can intercrop in pots. It's basically mean that you're growing more than one plant in any given space. Yeah. What we got over here? Okay. <laughs> Say hello, this is your cameo shot. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> oh, before I do something, I gotta tell you about 
like, Mr. T is a veteran. And for the last, like, two, three years, um, hey, Blue, for the last two, three years, he's been farming out here. When we first came, you didn't have water. So you can take these water tanks, and when the water falls in and gravity falls, you can put it a spout on here with a hose, and you can be able to water, like, all your crops and stuff. That's not wrong with it. So using, utilizing these tanks to be able to water is something important too, especially when you're out in a rural space and you don't have any water, you don't have a well, just use a tank and you can put a hose on it. All right. Blue. Hey, Blue. Hey, Bubby. How's it going? He's a farm dog, huh? Yeah. Blue. He dancing. Woo. Dancing Blue. <laughs> All right. This is African bluegrass. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. not only do we have like um, an urban garden, we have these, <laughs> we have like an herb area where we try to go like niche specialty herbs and basils and so, stuff of that nature. So here is uh, where we grow our African blue basil, and behind you we're growing hibiscus and we have certain trees here. So these are all orange trees, and this is hibiscus. Alright, hold it. Alright, so what kind of fruits are these? Is this the hibiscus? Yes, hibiscus, a sorrel. What? It's all edible. Oh, <laughs> You can make teas out of it. It's all natural. And it tastes really good. Really, really, really fragrant. Another thing we have is moringa, which is like the tree of life. Moringa has like a lot of nutrients in it. So we have moringa trees. All natural animals. Sugar cane. And we pour a comfrey at the bottom of the base of all our plants. Now what exactly is comfrey? So comfrey is I would say it's like an herb, but it's something else you can use um, to uh, naturally to mitigate plants and disease. And it can be used as a fertilizer if it's biodegraded or broken down into some type of liquid. So we put comfrey at the basis of most of our trees and plants. Um, now when it's the fall time, usually in the spring or summer, we have like a host of different herbs that we use, like ashwagandha, more basil, um, bitter leaf root, like a lot. We grow a lot, a lot of herbs. So I would say this is like our herb garden or our medicinal garden. Because um, not only plants are good for edible, but they're good for healing and medicinal purposes. All right. Where does all this food go, Jeremy? Are you eating it all? No. Nah. Well, you can see I'm getting kind of big. So, yeah, we're eating a lot. Uh, most of this food goes first. 10% um, we donate to churches. The other uh, portion we save for our family and distribute throughout our family. The third portion goes through our co-op um, at the Shrine Urban Farm. So we have a co-op to where we um, bring all these products from different farmers or different farms. We package produce and also we grow aquaponically and hydroponically there. And from there we sell to re different restaurants and different distributors. So um, we just try to build like a co-op model of all these small farmers and working together within a 30, 45 um, mile radius. So that way we can sh not only share resources, but we can be able to connect to be able to sell our products. Is there a food desert? Yes, to I'm glad I didn't touch it. This food goes to Houston, to the food desert. So we're 30, 45 miles away. Our co-op warehouse is inside of a food desert. And hopefully soon we look to have people to come out to be able to train here at the farm and the rural part. But most of this food goes to the city, to the urban part of Texas. It's good stuff. <laughs> yes. Is there a vision? We're for taking a one moringa moment oh, here. Yes, yes. Another good 
All right, shout out to the compost pile. Ah, how could I forget? How could I forget? This is the compost pile. So, um, we have like a pen to where we're doing goats. They're just not here at the moment. <laughs> and we have chickens. So we take these chicken wings, we take our scraps, we take most of the stuff that we need. So this is the compost pile. We created out of bird nettings, right? So all of this is four posts. And we use all our scraps of food in here and build up over time. And these are the things that we add to the garden to be able to provide more nutrients. Nice. So this is sustainable mini farm. All right, right. On to the big kahuna. <laughs> the big kahuna. So let's just, I, I'm going to come up here to the corner and we're just going to get a good oh, view. No we can watch with you. So a lot of people laugh at me and they're like, man, what's your style of growth? Yeah. I tell people I don't have like no direct style, but one of the things that I do is I broadcast seeds. I know it sounds weird and funny, like, hey, how come uh, your field only has uh, plants everywhere? It's because what we do is we broadcast, we take the seedlings, and we transplant them to pots, and we take the uh, seedling pots and we sell them. But once we thin them all out, the, the plants be, are able to grow. So this field, which is has weeds in it, but those weeds actually help because it shades uh, most of these plants because it's always hot. And again, we don't use any herbicides, so we don't really want to uh, spray in our right. fields. Is another reason why we broadcast versus direct seeding and uh, this allows us to grow at a huge propense rate so this field though it looks like only grass is full of radishes collards turnips mustards beets swiss chard i mean it's a lot of stuff it really is so if you don't mind we can walk through the field i actually have to check everything out all right all right and if you step on something don't be afraid <laughs> So this field full of stuff. Full of stuff. Now what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a radish. The thing about we plan on it like a timer, right? All right, so you're looking for a reddish? Right. That looks like a reddish. <laughs> we got a reddish in here? Reddish. Oh plant. my gosh, they're so pretty. So when we plant, we have like a timer, right? I mean, we have like a calendar. And on that calendar, if a seed, I mean, these seed radishes take 25 days, 25, 30 days. So we planted about a month and a half ago. It was like early. It was like early October, the first first week of October. So in one month and a few weeks, we've already starting to produce. So it's radishes all from here down to the back field. Oh, yeah. And so now in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna pick radishes, and then whatever the next uh, days is, whatever that plant uh, reaches that uh, maturity, and that's when we come back out and we plant. Now we water. 
uh, a little bit, but we try to on the field we try to depend as much on natural rainwater. And when you talk about the environment, is we haven't even gotten any rain, and we barely get any rain. So for farmers or producers, these are some of the things that we deal with environmentally. Um, and like I said, it's already November and it's still hot it's still 70 to 80 day i mean 70 to 80 degrees when it should be you know way less cooler so we deal with a lot of things and we have to adjust and that's why i think our push for sustainability in urban and rural environments like growing aquaponics and hydroponics or inside containers or just different it allows us to be able to limit our risk and still be able to um grow the traditional ways and maximize if you kind of understand so pose with your radishes oh <laughs> so these are french breakfast radishes oh yeah. my gosh yeah cool i probably should wash them out but i usually eat them whole. <laughs> <laughs> don't do this at home is it an extra mineral seasoning exactly you need all the minerals you can <laughs> but uh yeah this is this is the farm i mean we can check out the chickens and the pens Let's go look at the How are we doing on time? We're good. All right. Uh, about... Okay, Jeremy, where are we headed next? Tell right our audience. Now, right now, we headed to go see the chickens. All right. Let's go see the chickens. Go into Thanksgiving, and we don't have any turkeys, but we will look at the chickens. Uh, I've heard somebody say that's how they're going to do coronavirus Thanksgiving. It's just uh, doing a bunch of chickens. All right. <laughs> so this is our goat pen. We don't have any goats here today, but the pen is already up. And our goats, they just eat up the grass. Another form of weed management. <laughs> <laughs> Tractor. <laughs> this is a water bucket, a gravity bed. So, so yeah, this is a gravity fed water bucket. You just poke a hole in it, you put it up at a high place, run the line into your water, and it falls down in there. Radishes. Are they hungry? They're seeing it. Yeah, they poking. Yeah, so every day we eat the girls. We produce some eggs. Let's see if they have some eggs. Let's check it out.
Oh, that's so cool how that opens in the back. Wow, yeah. yeah. Every day, they produce an egg. So every chicken gives like one egg, theoretically? One egg a day. Sometimes, you know, you might have one or two that don't. But yeah, they're supposed to drop an egg a day. You know, under the right conditions. But uh, yeah, those are the girls. Nice. So yeah, our goal is just to again just have like a sustainable farm, sustainable mini farm. Not only that we can feed us and feed our family, but that we can uh, teach and train and just generate some income and revenue throughout the co-op. And uh, yeah, give us a call to action, Jeremy. All right. Yes, a call to action. Ah oh, man, I would say, um, and we kind of talked about this earlier, like land. They're not making any more land. We're land rich. We're, if land is just sitting and we're not doing nothing with it, I mean, we really can't produce anything. So we got to be more producers and better stewards of our land. Uh, we're dealing with so many things environmentally and urban environments and rural environments. And the rural areas, they need um, certain things that the urban environments have. And the urban environments have certain things that the rural environments have. You can't grow um, a large scale, commercial scale in the urban environment unless you're doing like aquaponics, hydroponics inside some commercial warehouse to build it. So like I kind of alluded to earlier, the things we're growing out here, we're taking to the food desert. We're taking to the people. These, This is fresh, organic, natural food. I mean, we don't use any herbicides, any pesticides. And all these things mean, mean a lot because we live here on this earth, we live here in this environment, and um, not only for this generation, but we gotta take care, take care of it for the next generations to come. So all my um, future youth, uh, agriculturalists, environmentalists, agribusiness, uh, water conservationists, everything. I used to work for the USDA. Do your best and do anything you can to create the best future we can. Uh, stay focused on the environment, continue to recycle, and remember that um, we only get one earth, we only have one land, and we gotta do the most out of it, the most with it, um, per se. And um, I would say continue to support the CEC and the things that they're doing um, by just connecting with the people who are really doing the work and connecting with the people who's really making sure that our earth and our land is uh, being conserved right. And uh, I'm just glad you guys had the opportunity to come out here to see what we're doing. And I appreciate you. <laughs> Jay, Yay. if we wanted to find you on Facebook, where would we find you? Um, oh, so you can find us at Fresh Life Organic on Facebook. You can find us at Fresh Life Organic on Instagram. And you can find us at freshlifehtx.com if you want to check out some of our um, services, some of our products, and just some of the things we're doing in the community. You know, this is our logo. I mean, we've been in Houston, Texas. Uh, we've been doing this since 2016 for four years. It's all for the community. It's all for agriculture. It's all for the people. No matter who you are or what you look like, and we appreciate you. We really awesome. Do. Keep waiting by. <laughs> Keep waiting by.